Number five. Our first story, and not to give away too much of the plot here, but a lot of the other stories, came from a Reddit thread positing the question, what's your scariest Home Alone story? There were many good ones, but the literal top comment was this by Killer or Angel. It was an average night around 9 p.m. Me and my cousin are at his house, and I'm sitting for the night while my mom and aunt are shopping, and my dad and uncle are at the movies. We're just sitting there feeling strange. Something was wrong, but I couldn't really put my finger on it. I got up and walked to the back door to lock it. When I came back, I saw what was causing that weird feeling. In the window, there was a decrepit and homeless looking man just staring into the window looking at us. My protector instincts turned on. I pretended I didn't see the guy and I told my cousin it was time to go to bed because it was too late. I took him upstairs knowing damn well there was a man outside that wanted in. Now at the time, I was 5 foot 8 and only about 125 pounds. I did play football at school though. If I remember correctly, I went downstairs to grab a meat tenderizer and I turned back to the window. He wasn't there. I ran to the front door and made sure it was locked and then I ran back upstairs and went to my cousin and sat down in front of the door. He asked me what was happening and I told him it was nothing to worry about, that he should just get some sleep. I called the cops and then my dad. The cops said they were half an hour away and my dad was 45 minutes away. I heard a window shatter and the sound of boots. I told my cousin to stay completely silent and hide under the blankets. It was horrifying. I grabbed the tenderizer and waited. About five minutes passed and I hear the boots walk upstairs. I heard him opening the doors to my aunt and uncle's bedroom, then the bathroom. I heard him make his way to the basement. After what felt like forever, the cops burst in kicking the door in and got the guy. Turned out, he was an escapee from a mental hospital a full province away. That's literally like the plot line to a horror movie. Absolutely terrifying, but good on him for having that big cousin instinct and making sure that the cousin was safe. And if you're looking for more freaky stories in this sort of vein, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. If you want something else a little spicier than scary stories, we got aliens, cryptids, conspiracies, true crime, anything freaky, we've done a video or two on. So hit subscribe, please hit that little bell so you don't miss a scream. But would you kindly do that at the end of this video? Because I got four more scary Home Alone stories coming up for you right now. Number four. It's another post from this same thread asking about people's scary Home Alone stories. This one very likely is going to have you locking the door tight and probably spending the night with the blankets pulled all the way up to your eyes. I had just moved into my first apartment. It was around 8.30 p.m. and I heard the doorknob moving like somebody was putting a key in it and turning and knocking. At first, I got pretty excited that my at the time boyfriend was home, but then I realized that it was too early in the day. He usually came home nearer to 11 and it was only 8.30 still. So I looked outside at the kitchen window and I didn't see his car or anyone's car that I recognized parked outside and that's when I started to panic. The doorknob kept moving for a few more seconds and then stopped. A few minutes later, they had some piece of metal that they were sticking between the door to try and open the door. I freaked out and I locked myself in the bathroom. I grabbed a blade from the kitchen to try and protect myself. I called the cops. Whatever was on the other end was trying to pry the bathroom door open for about three full minutes before they stopped. Interrupting the story a bit, can you even imagine how horrifying that would be? Three minutes locked in your bathroom waiting for the boys in blue to arrive while someone's clawing at your door? This person is braver than I. For context, this video has been about four minutes up to this point. Imagine the entire video you just watched, but you're petrified and shaking in a bathroom. Anyway, back to the story. Eventually the cops came in and they found an elderly man roaming my apartment with a crowbar. He used to live in my apartment and he wanted a bunch of stuff back that we took when we moved in. Police told me he was delusional. I'm so thankful and glad I didn't answer to the door. To this day, my heart still skips a beat when someone knocks on my door. And mine too, I don't think I'm opening my door for strangers anytime soon. In at three, r slash scared shitless. This subreddit is exactly what you would expect. Scary visuals and stories to scare the complete and utter shit out of you. Wonderful. Now, it does mostly contain GIFs and videos, but here is one post that caught my attention. I quote, I got a text from a number that I didn't recognize that said, ha ha, along with the link. I clicked the link, it opened in Safari and prompted me to use my current location. I allowed, page was blank. Two hours later I saw lightning or something from outside. Turned, nothing. Didn't really think about it. Kind of put two and two together the next day. I went back to that website. It was now a picture of the back of my head watching TV with a flash reflection in the middle. I went back to the text but it was gone. Deleted. The most recent picture taken on my phone was a video, though taken after 3am. I was long asleep. My bill online confirms a rich media text was sent to that number I didn't recognize at the time. The video is a walkthrough of my house, showing the front 
front door, sliding back door and big windows including a close up on the lock of the biggest window. My house key was missing off the keychain when I looked later. My shit is freaked. This is absolutely terrifying. So essentially this guy shared his location with a stranger who then came to his house, took pictures of him before breaking in and filming him on his own phone. No thank you. Never share your location. In it to r slash no sleep. Similar to our last number this subreddit focuses on fictional and non fiction stories that will keep you up at night. Now there are your typical ghostly encounters and messages from beyond the grave but this one really stuck out for me. It's a long one so bear with me. I quote I recently went through a pretty nasty divorce but I got the only thing that mattered out of it, full custody of my 4 year old son. Lost everything else in the process so we had to relocate to a new house with barely any luggage or furniture. Truly a fresh new start. I heard him call for me during our first night at our new home. It was a little after midnight I think. I went to check on him to see what was wrong and sat by his bedside. He was wide awake and asked me to check the closet for monsters which wasn't surprising given the circumstances. He's still just a little kid and without even taking into account all the crap he's been put through thanks to my shitty marriage, moving into an unfamiliar barely finished home must be a lot to take him for someone his age. And you know how they say that your brain always stays half awake when you're sleeping in a new environment right? That's all pretty much what went through my mind in a flash as soon as my son spoke. It was no big deal, it was all normal. But something else almost immediately clicked inside my brain before I even got to look at where my son had pointed to while he made his innocent request. Something was wrong. I turned my head and looked and it took everything I had in me not to give in to fear and terror, all for the sake of my son. When you become a parent you have to protect your children no matter what, always putting yourself in harm's way if necessary, and spare them any and all kinds of things that might hurt them. That's why I didn't freak out. I couldn't, not when we had barely just started our new life. I had to protect him and at that point in time as I sat on his bed I only knew one thing. We had to leave the room. We had to leave the house immediately. Alright champ, of course I said, faking bravery. Then I made a request of my own. As I lowered my voice and got closer to him, hey how about you step outside for a minute. There's a monster in there, I'll have to kick its butt all over your room. He chuckled and said okay. I made sure to put some extra emphasis on the word but because it's something that always cracks him up when I say it. Fortunately he got stuck on that and not the fact that I was indirectly admitting to the possibility of there actually being a monster. As soon as he left the room my mind raced as it started to put together the best and most efficient route to take him out of the house while picking up my car keys and phone on our way out. When I heard the closet door slowly creaking open behind me I knew it was time to go. I jumped out of the bed, exited the room and grabbed my son. We were out the door and inside the car and moving in under a minute. I told him I couldn't sleep so we were going out for some ice cream to celebrate. He was a little taken aback and asked what we were celebrating to which I replied just us two together. I love you buddy. It was by no means a lie but I just had to make sure that he was alright and wouldn't think of anything else as we literally fled our new house. As I mentioned earlier, the house was a new environment for the two of us. I had been there a couple of times before, cleaned it all up myself and assembled what little furniture we had so I knew for a fact what belonged where and what didn't and I know his room didn't have a closet. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I was not expecting that ending, truly terrifying. What I really want to know is where the closet came from. Did someone install it before they moved in? Did ghost put it there? Was the boy just seeing things? I need answers. And finally in number one, r slash let's not meet. Now as you would expect, this subreddit contains terrifying encounters with strangers in life and on the internet. So as you can imagine these are some pretty terrifying posts. This in particular stood out to me. I quote, I was driving home from work at 2am. I'm a nurse and I live in a small city. The roads were totally deserted and it was a freezing night. I don't live far from work, maybe a couple of miles. I'm driving down a residential street around the corner from my house and I see a man laying face down in the street. Now remember, I'm a nurse. My first thought was, great, gotta help this guy up. I was coming off a long shift and falls happen all the time. As I slowed down the car I suddenly realised what an idiot move that was. I'm a hundred pound woman and I don't carry any weapons. I thought I should do something to help the guy so I called 911 as I drove past him and slowed to a stop at the end of the block. While I was stopped at the light I explained to the dispatcher that there was a man in the road who might need assistance. All of a sudden I hear a loud bang bang from the driver's side window. I screamed and looked over. A man was pounding on my window and jiggling the handle of my locked car. I looked in the rearview mirror and saw that there was no man lying in the street now. Still on the phone with 911 I screamed, I'm so scared, to the dispatcher and floored it through the red light. I quickly told him what had happened and even though I was right by my house he told me to keep driving. After a few minutes I had calmed down and he told me to loop back around. I pulled over down the road from my house and stayed in the car. I didn't see the man anywhere so I got off the phone 
phone with the dispatcher who told me he was sending a police car to cruise the area. As I gathered up my things I did a final scan of the area and I saw the man. He was walking with two other men. I hunched way down in the car until they were far down the road, then bolted him to my house. I don't know if he had ill intent but it freaks me the hell out that he wasn't alone. Always lock your car doors and carry mace. End quote. Oh boy, no no no. So essentially this guy in the road was likely waiting for people to pull over to rob them or worse. It's common knowledge that gangs will often attack cars at night, gathering in the middle of the road to trick them into getting out of the car. When in doubt, just call 911. Number 5. Walking Dead My first true tale of phantasmic terror comes to us from reddit user Jalka. Answering a question posed in the thread, nurses and doctors of reddit, what's the weirdest and most paranormal thing you've ever experienced? Hospitals already seem pretty haunted as is, so it's no surprise that there was so many good answers. But Jowcott stood out. Take a listen. I'm a psychiatric nurse, and early on in my career, I worked at a residential mental health facility. One of our residents was an elective mute, which means that he didn't talk, but there was no medical reasoning as to why. He had spoken earlier in his life, and in fact seemed quite normal back then, with the exception of being close to 7 feet tall. He'd been raised in the deep south and joined the army when he was 19, but one night he vanished. He was declared AWOL, and eventually he was declared missing, and later officially declared dead. However, 10 years later, a 7 foot tall man walked into a Virginia hospital ER in my part of the Midwest and said to the receptionist, My name is Marion Deshed and I've been dead for 10 years. And according to the Redditor, those were the last words he ever spoke to anyone. He had shown up to the hospital covered in dust and wearing an old uniform that he'd been wearing the night he vanished. His social security had not been used at all and he had no ID on him whatsoever. However, via fingerprints, they were able to identify him. The family was notified, but they said they had already grieved their lost man and that whoever was claiming to be him simply wasn't, and asked to never be contacted again. The nurse went on to add that Marion would pace all day, every day, moving his mouth in a way that looked like he was muttering to himself, but nothing came out when he moved his lips. He had an unnerving habit of throwing his head back with his mouth wide open as if he was laughing hysterically but not so much as a breath could ever be heard. The nurse said she tried talking to him almost daily, and he would appear to listen, but only reacts by periodically throwing his head back in that laughter mimicking way of his. Various medications and treatment plans were pursued, but nothing ever affected him. Therapy was tried as well, but all that would happen was Marion would just grin and start pacing again. She goes on to say that on her last day, she saw Marion pacing in the parking lot, throwing back his head to laugh. She closes by saying all those years she'd wondered, was he a ghost? And all those years later, she still doesn't know. Click through and listen to as many top 5 scary videos as your ears can handle. Moving on. Number 4. Things that go bunk in the night. Now you would never ever ever believe this, but our next story comes from Reddit as well. A similar thread, a similar question. What's the most paranormal thing you've ever experienced? Lots of good ones to pick from, but this one from Mad Rampager really stood out for me. I used to be in the military. The training camp bunk that we lived in was said to be haunted. Occasionally, our stuff would go missing and reappear in weird places, like under our bed or inside a bag that we'd zipped up and stuff. No big deal, right? Weird things happen, and I mean human error and all that. Well then came the instance that freaked everybody out. It was night, after lights out, and my friend was on his phone texting his girlfriend. Most of us had been drifting off to sleep and we were lying on our beds when suddenly my friend heard the shuffling of feet from the corridor. So, thinking that it was our sergeant, he quickly hit his phone under his pillow, rolled over on his side, and tried to get to sleep. What happened next still chills me to the bone to this day. While he pretended to sleep, he heard someone right behind him at the other end of the bed saying, don't worry, you can continue to pretend to sleep. I could have dismissed this as a figment of his imagination, except me and five other people around him heard it. Creepier still, there was no one there. And weirdly, it sounded like the voice of a young girl that had said it. For reference, our camp was in the middle of an island and was set up away from the main admin building. The island had been closed by the government for army training purposes for the past 15 years, so there were definitely no civilians around, let alone any children. To make matters freakier, when we came back from our weekend home leave, there was a bunch of hair on his bed, neatly bundled up, long and jet black, and underneath his pillow was a note. Remember me? Now as I said, we're in the middle of a forest, in the middle of an island, and at that point in time, there were no female recruits whatsoever on the island. Our bunks were locked for the weekend, and the duty sergeant had no idea what had happened. We never spoke about it again after that night, and it still chills me every time I think about it. 
Number three. I was home alone and my parents were out of town. We just moved into the house, so there was an empty lot next to the house with a half built house on it. My parents were the types to always leave the door unlocked. Well, they were gone. I was watching TV when all of a sudden, the door that leads into my garage from the inside starts to wiggle. I put my TV on mute to listen and I see it move this time. I start freaking out and I'm kind of in shock looking for the phone. I can't find the house phone, so I search for myself. I remembered I left my charger in my parents' car, so now I am frantically looking for the house phone. Our house was pretty new, so my mom hadn't even put blinds or drapes up in the kitchen or living room. Again, no blinds, no phone. Whoever was wiggling the doorknob starts banging on the windows in the living room. I shoot upstairs looking frantically for the phone and also trying to figure out how and where I'd jump out of my house to get away from the maniac that's probably outside my door if I needed to. He then starts pounding on my door. I can tell at this point that he's using something metal or plastic by the sound of the thumps. I genuinely thought he was going to shoot my door open. I remember at that because I was mad at myself for being such a fool. I I frequently talked on the phone and I always just left it lying around. I never put it back on the base. I wanted so badly to push the button to detect where my house phone is, but I thought if he heard where it was, he'd break the window near it and take it. I then remembered. I left the phone in my mom's room. And as I pass the hallway, I see her dad's old weapon in my parents' bedroom, a long arm. I find the phone and I call 911. As I'm on the phone, the window breaks. I'm upstairs and I am scared to death and suddenly everything goes silent. I'm waiting in my parents bedroom, pitch black closet for what seems like eternity. I hear the sirens. Cops show up but there's no one to be found. I figured they hadn't gone too far since the incident had just occurred, but the cops never found my tormentor. On the plus side, the company that built the house next to us hired overnight security for the house, which was definitely refreshing. Number two. In fall 2016, I moved into half of a really old house. It was built in the 1880s, a stone's throw from the original campus of Indiana State, which is now a park filled with homeless people. The owners basically turned it into a weird duplex kind of deal. Anyway, the layout of this house was pretty weird. You walked in the door and you were in a living room type space and then you kept walking and there was a doorway to a bedroom and past that was the kitchen. No doors. Only door inside the apartment was to the bathroom and one that led to the shared basement. This is a terrible living situation, may I say. My first night there was uneventful. I was kind of uncomfortable because I hadn't lived by myself in a long time and I was just sort of feeling lonely and on edge. I stayed up late and eventually fell asleep but woke up around 3 in the morning. Cliche, I know. What woke me up? sounded like a group of drummers were drumming on every flat surface of the living room. It went on for a while and I was completely terrified. It was just a cacophony of sound. After about two or three minutes, I finally gathered up the courage to get up and check on it. And as I soon as I passed the threshold to the living room, it just stopped. Nothing happened the rest of the night, but I didn't get much sleep at all. A couple of days later, my friend was visiting and he was about to leave. We were standing by the front door to my bookshelf and I told him about how I was having trouble sleeping. And I told him that story about my first night there. As I was saying this, a book threw itself off the bookshelf and onto the floor three feet away. It had to fly past the dresser the shelf was perched and landed between the two of us. He just gave me a creeped out look and said, I have to go. And I don't blame him. Eventually, I asked the guy in the other half of the apartment what was up, as he'd lived there for eight years. He told me that no one stayed longer than a year and they all reported the same stuff. For whatever reason, he said nothing ever happened on his side. Doesn't make sense, but there it is. And sometimes, you just don't get the answers, and that's way scarier. And number one, do you remember your first job? Mine was a newspaper route. Maybe yours was like a grocery store clerk or a babysitter. This next tale is a tale of babysitting gone deeply wrong. Perhaps one of the most infamous home invasion stories in American history is the babysitter killings in 1978. Lauren Strode was a young woman looking to take on a bit of responsibility and earn some spare pocket cash for the upcoming summer. She and her friends had a bit of a sitter's club. On October 31st, 1978, Strode was looking after Tommy Doyle, a neighborhood boy while his parents were out, alongside friends Ann Brackett and Linda Vanderklok looking after one Lindsay Wallace. It seemed like it would be a fun night like any other in a sleepy town. Unfortunately, unbeknownst to the girls, earlier that week a mental patient from Smith's Grove Sanitarium nearby 
had escaped containment and was on the loose and suspected to be around the Haddonfield area. A quiet investigation being led by Sheriff Brackett, Anne's father, and a psychiatrist at Smith's Grove was underway to try and apprehend the patient, who had been incarcerated after killing his sister years ago in a fit of unprecedented terrifying violence. The patient had disguised himself and was stalking the streets of Haddonfield and had come across Strode out of a psychotic obsession. He stalked the girl for days until eventually making his move, and then proceeded to invade the home of Linda Vanderklok and strangled her alongside boyfriend Bobby Sims. Strode protected the youth she was looking after, and thankfully both Tommy Doyle and Lindsay Wallace were not harmed in any way, and boldly attacked the invader with a knitting needle, subduing him long enough for authorities to arrive, where he was apprehended and returned to Smith's Grove Sanitarium, where he remained for 40 years. Strode remained in Haddonfield, where she lives quietly and would prefer not to be disturbed, looking after her daughter and granddaughter, and does not celebrate Halloween much anymore. Alrighty everybody, I'm kicking off today with a story that triggered some nightmares for me. So if chatting about stalking and harassment is too much for you, I'd recommend skipping ahead now, because this story feels like something straight out of a horror movie, but worse. So there's this dude, right? Let's call him Villain, because his Reddit username has a cuss word in it that I cannot say. He spells this whole story about how he basically orchestrated this insane scheme involving his girlfriend's friend, Sarah. Strap in, because it's a wild ride. Okay, so it all starts innocently enough. They're out hanging out with Deb, his girlfriend, you know, and Sarah. Sarah's phone needs a little pin to be unlocked, and our dude here casually memorizes it, because that's not red flag number one or anything. Fast forward, Sarah leaves her phone lying around like it's no big deal, and uh, oh bother. What does our guy do? He dives right in and hits the jackpot. Some nudies, videos, messages with somebody named Jeff, and a lot of other explicit content I can't talk about. Ruh -ruh. But it gets crazier. Our dude concocts this elaborate plan that's more of a slow burn than the plot of A Court of Thorns and Roses. He starts ghosting Deb, but he keeps Sarah close, like suspiciously close. And then, here's the kicker, he creates this alter ego online, and let's call her Vanessa. Like, who has time for that level of catfishing drama? I know I barely have enough time to cook food these days, never mind plot a mystery that would confuse the Scooby gang. So Vanessa starts blackmailing Jeff, giving him an ultimatum to stop talking to Sarah or risk having his private collection leave. So for context, Jeff is the guy that Sarah's talking to. So Jeff chickens out, drops Sarah like a hot potato, but Sarah, bless her heart, she's not having it. She stands her ground, and our dude has to switch up tactics. So Vanessa disappears for a hot minute until our guy gets his hand on Sarah's phone again. He installs some spy app, because, you know, boundaries are just a suggestion at this point. And then, oh boy, Vanessa's back and armed with all the tea on Sarah's convos. Don't worry, it gets more twisted. We've got a whole labyrinth here. Sarah comes crying to our guy about being blackmailed by some mystery person. Person. And what does he do? Swoops in like a knight in shining armor and frames Jeff as the villain. In the end, our dude plays the hero and ends up with Sarah. Because apparently nothing brings people together like a good old fashioned blackmail scheme. And they live happily ever after, I guess? Somebody needs to tell Sarah the truth at some point because good bleep and grief, this makes me want to burst into flames. Manipulation ain't it, folks. And that's not just my trauma speaking. Alright, sorry to say it everybody, but we're not getting any better yet. We have a killing confession next up on the docket today. A Reddit user was reported to the FBI after after he used a popular cuddly bear meme to seemingly confess to killing his sister's boyfriend. The user named Narado posted a thread with the title, Finally Have the Guts to Say It, to Reddit's Advice Animals subforum back in 2013. So the thread linked to the meme known as Confession Bear, and the startling admission read, My sister had a bad addict boyfriend. I killed him with his own substances while he was unconscious, and they ruled it as an overdose. If you think my wording is off, pardon me. I feel like I need to start carrying around a redacted board. The meme is usually reserved for silly confessions, so within minutes, a lot of stunned Reddit users began commenting on the photo, being like, is, is this true? And also like, when, where, why, how, huh? Narada responded just once to the stream of comments, claiming some of the confession was true and then said it was a joke. He said, and I quote, I posted this wondering what would happen. There is some truth behind it, but I'm not saying what was true and what wasn't. If I had a dollar for every time someone took me seriously on the internet, I would be able to retire from today alone. I'm sorry to anyone that I've offended to the point of ruining their lives. If you want to catch a killer, get out of your house and put on some tights and go fight crime. I'm quite done with Reddit tonight. Back to the shadows of lurking. The world isn't quite ready for me. So in now deleted comments, other Reddit users began unearthing Narado's personal details which were publicly available, including like full name, date of birth, patient, employer, location, Facebook accounts, Twitter, MySpace. And then they began debating, should we contact the authorities? So in the end, they were like, yeah, absolutely we should. So the posting of Narada's personal information on Reddit prompted him to add this little PS. He's like, oh, the reason for this post and the admittance, it was a joke because people started posting my own personal information. 
information. Sure, you can find information about me, but link me to something that's happening is completely different. I made a meme about something, and it turned into people revealing my personal information, which was quite rude and very uncalled for. He also posted a second meme stating, if you joke about killing people on Reddit without a throwaway account, you're gonna have a bad time. So fueling speculation that the confession could be true, he then deleted his Reddit account, as well as his Facebook and other social media pages. Now, later user Lionheart 1610k revealed that he was in the military. So this guy, so how did they find everything on him by the way? Oh, it's because his post history had his middle name, his birthday, job history, military rank, as well as a ton of info about where he lived. So some folks googled his username, found a Steam profile with the same info and a full name. That's how we matched up everything else. So he upvoted the info himself, saying he didn't give a bleep, but then he backpedaled, deleted all his stuff, closed his Facebook, and what more. Which like folks, once again, digital footprint. So what happened next? Well, the police dug into the story, found out that his sister didn't have any sort of boyfriend at the time, and that the entire thing was fake. Still, that's a little too crazy for my liking, and allow me to preach one more time, digital footprint people. Be careful what you put out there. You don't want people finding your home. Trust me. Number three, old friends. Our next story is from a Reddit thread asking, what's your ghost story? And I gotta point this one out just because it was too funny, but the original poster included the title in brackets, serious, to deter any would-be paranormal pranksters. Just serious ghost stories, please. Luckily, Redditors obliged. User Barbed Cats shared this terrifying tale. When I was 37, I went to my high school reunion. I flew into the nearest airport and rented a car. The distance was about 35 miles through a very rural and almost abandoned part of the country. About three miles outside of town, I see someone on the side of the road flagging me down. Up in the North Woods, no one ever leaves someone else stranded, and it would turn out that the guy standing there was somebody I'd actually been to school with, my old friend Jim. Jim gets in the car and we start talking, catching up. I hadn't seen him in 20 years, but he still looked the same, maybe just a little bit older. We get to town and I ask him if he wants to come to the reunion with me and have a drink. He says no, just take me back home. Jim's parents had lived only a few blocks from my grandmother's and I turned in that direction, but he said to take him to the part of town that really was just the outskirts, up by the fairground and the cemetery. There was a mobile home park out there and I figured that must be where he lived. When we reached the end of the turn, he said, just drop me off here. It was nice to see you again. And he walked off into the night. So I went to the high school reunion, met up with some old classmates and we start to talk. Now please understand me here. I am stone cold sober, nor do I ever take anything harder than soda. Tired after a 13 hour flight, but I was completely sober. As we were talking about who was showing up and who wasn't, I mentioned to my old classmate that I just picked Jim up a few miles off east of town and had dropped him up by the fairgrounds. Now for some reason everyone got really, really quiet. Even the guy belting out karaoke stopped. And my cousin went white as a shirt. Barb. Jim died eight years ago. Rolled his car. I start to feel really dizzy and I go out to the car to take some deep breaths and decide whether or not I'm going crazy. And there on the seat was a newspaper printed eight years ago containing Jim's obituary. I still have that damn paper. Every now and again, I take it out to stare at it and I still wonder just what the hell happened that night. Number two, Ghost on the Line. The next story comes to us from a thread asking law enforcement officers of Reddit, what is the creepiest call that you've ever been on? We got a very creepy answer from user Smokey Bonaparte sharing this creepy little tale. The Redditor writes, 911 dispatcher calling in. We received a call from an elderly lady who had trouble breathing. I had taken several calls from her before and her husband in the past, so I recognized the voice. I dispatched an ambulance to her residence and held her on the line trying to keep her calm while the ambulance was responding. Ambulances advised that they had a 15 minute ETA as she was in a very rural part of West Virginia. I'm talking to her just about her husband and how she was doing and just making pretty standard small talk with her. The ambulance arrives and I let them know that she is in severe respiratory distress and I still had her on the line. I let her know the ambulance is coming to her door to go answer the door and she says okay and hangs up the phone. Oh that's pretty normal right? Well, here's where it gets very weird. The EMT and paramedic on scene call back about a minute after and they say that no one is answering the door. We have a sheriff in the area pulling on scene about that time. The sheriff unit confirmed the address and he's breaching the door to make access to the PT. Five minutes go by and the paramedic on scene radios to ask me who called. I tell them it was the elderly woman who lived on residence. He tells me he's going to call this in and he needs to speak with my shift supervisor. We get him over to the supervisor and the supervisor confirms the same information I relayed, that it was all correct, and asks what's going on. Apparently the old woman had been dead for a while 
and was already in full rigor mortis. They thought I was wrong on the caller, but the other dispatchers played it back for them and confirmed it was the old woman who called. The ambulance transferred the hospital and we got the same calls and disbelief from the doctors. But I took a call from a ghost that day. Number one, uninvited guest. Closing off our list is this story which chilled my spine like sub-zero. Coming to us from user parole model, which hey, by the way, love the pun. It was from an ask reddit thread asking, what's the creepiest thing that's ever happened to you? Lots and lots and lots of good ones, but this one took the cake. So lend an ear. I used to visit my friend at her house out in a rural farming area before she moved. I'd sleep over a lot and we'd just hang out and draw. I usually slept in the living room and on the couch, and there were two mirrors in the room that were fairly close to the TV. When the TV was off and I was walking by, I started seeing shadows move behind me. I thought it might just be something off the TV screen, and then one evening I walked into the living room to get my sketchbook so I could sketch in her bedroom. I bent over and picked it up, stood up straight, and I looked in the mirror and saw a man behind me. A man standing in the hallway leading to the living room. He was average height, bald, and a bit old. I turned to look at him and no one was there. I turned to look at the mirror again and he was gone. I felt more than a little spooked. Another time we were just sitting in the living room and we heard what sounded like a kid's footsteps running across upstairs quickly. She had two adult siblings but they were out at work leaving us all alone. Around that time I decided to sleep in my friend's room instead of the living room only to wake up in the middle of the night to see four posters slowly get peeled off the wall. No, it wasn't just them falling and dragging each other down. It looked as if someone was carefully unsticking the tape and removing them. The next morning my friend put them back up saying, well I need to get some better tape. She and her family eventually moved out because they couldn't afford to keep living there anymore. We would never really talked about anything that had happened in that house, as if talking about it might actually make it worse. But after she moved, I finally confronted her and said it. I said, dude, your house was haunted. I hope you knew that. She replied, yeah, we knew it was. Some guy and his granddaughter used to live there, but he took her life and then took his own. So it was probably them or something. I never told you because I didn't want to scare you. Later, she would dig out a copy of a news article she got from a local paper about the crime. The picture that went with the article was the exact man I saw all those years ago. Number 5, my mom left me a set of tapes to watch after she died. Our first tale today was written in October of 2020 by user TJ Leah. It is narrated by a character named Nick whose mother passed away when they were after a short and awful bout with cancer. Now this tale unfolds through a series of videos, milestones, you know, in his life, all curated by his late mother, Leonora Stankowski. A seemingly ordinary concept, you know, capturing moments on tape. Well, it kind of takes a haunting turn as Nick confronts the spectral legacy of his family. Leonora's videos, a loving gesture frozen in time, serve as a poignant connection between a mother and her son. The milestones, from the loss of a tooth to the trials of adolescence, are immortalized on film. A peculiar ritual, a glimpse into a life cut short by illness, reveals a mother's undying love for her crown prince. Yet beneath the warmth lies a chilling under current that Nick is yet to comprehend. As the narrative unfolds, we are taken on a roller coaster of emotions. Nick's life is marked by tragedy and eerie encounters, all captured in the foreboding glow of the milestone tapes. The sinister entity that lurks in the background, whispered about but seldom seen, becomes an ominous presence in the narrative. The turning point arrives when Nick faces his own brush with mortality, a moment captured in a tape that unveils a grotesque figure accompanying his mother. A chilling revelation ensues, unraveling a familial curse that transcends generations, passing from father to daughter, mother to son. The entity, ancient and malevolent, feeds on misfortune and it kinda plagues the uh, Stankowski lineage. Now Leonora desperately attempted to break the cycle, and this was encapsulated in the final tape, but it casts an unsettling shadow over Nick's existence. This entity, drawn to the vulnerability of broken bones and shattered lives, becomes an ever-present specter, and uh, you know, a curse that Nick is now tasked with navigating, armed with only the tapes and the weight of generational anguish. The narrative's intensity peaks as Nick, now a father himself, grapples with the realization that his daughter, Phoebe, is destined to inherit the family curse. The story pivots on a delicate balance between the supernatural and the human, blurring the lines between nightmare and reality. 
reality. In a chilling revelation, Leonora imparts a solemn duty on Nick to protect Phoebe at any cost, regardless of the toll it takes on others. The narrative leaves us on the precipice of uncertainty, as Nick contemplates the gravity of his responsibility, haunted by the lurking presence that persists in the periphery of his world. Honestly, I loved reading this one, so I highly recommend. Number 4. My Girlfriend Would Answer One Question Every Night in Her Sleep This next story is courtesy of author The Buffed, and while it's since reached multiple installments, today I'll just be discussing part 1 and leave you anticipating more parts. So, picture this, you meet somebody special. Things move quickly, and then the nocturnal peculiarities commence. Now, before you dismiss this as just another spooky tale, let's dissect the nuances that make this narrative more than just a run of the mill scary story. Our protagonist begins innocently enough, spending nights with his new flame, but the tranquility of these evenings is shattered when his partner, in a half asleep state, demands to be asked a question each night. A seemingly, you know, harmless quirk, right? Uh -uh, wrong. It unfolds like a cryptic ritual, an unsettling dance where questions must be posed and answers extracted, if you will. You kind of get like a surreal descent into a psychological labyrinth. The nightly interrogations become more than just a quirky little bedtime routine. Yeah, they morph into a haunting journey into the unknown. The girlfriend, blissfully unaware during the day, becomes a conduit to a realm where questions hold an eerie power, and the answers aren't exactly what you want to hear. As the narrative unfolds, the tension tightens like a coiled spring. Now, the protagonist, caught in a web of I don't know what, grapples with the surreal demands of his nighttime interrogator. The questions evolve from the mundane to the existential, unveiling a cosmic horror that transcends, you know, anything I can explain. The climax, though, kind of takes a bit of an unexpected turn. We find out a very chilling revelation about the demise of our narrator's partner, and uh, our protagonist is kind of pushed to the brink. It kind of also pivots from the supernatural to deeply human, as he's contemplating the actions that uh, kind of go against everything we want to believe in. And then just as the darkness is threatening to consume everything, we get a little twist. A change, if you will. Perhaps even a glimmer of hope. The girlfriend is no longer a mere victim of the night. She's now a partner in unraveling the mysteries that plague the uh, shared existence. It's kind of a hopeful note. Now, as we ponder the implications of this crazy tale, you can be left with like a lingering unease. What if the things that go bump in the night are not supernatural entities, but the unresolved questions that haunt our relationships? What if, you know, in confronting the unknown, we find not terror, but the resilience of human spirit? And so, you know, fellow folks out there in the vast digital wilderness, I leave you with this. What if, in the silence of the night, the questions we leave unanswered become the ghosts that linger, haunting our minds? I know, I wanted to get kind of deep with it. Let me have my moment, okay? Okay, how about we talk about something that's horrible and heartbreaking, but less kill everything and everyone next? So this feels like a tale straight out of a Lifetime movie. This dude spills the tea on his upbringing, and let me tell you, it's a roller coaster of emotions. My favorite thing to say, picture this. So he's raised by his psycho birth mother, who's dead set on having a daughter. Like, she's so obsessed with the idea of having a little girl that she straight up raises her son as a girl. So this poor guy grows up thinking, oh, he's a girl, going to a religious school for girls and living his best life. How? Well, it seems like the mom was a pretty successful professional in a legal field, not entirely sure what, and had him via anonymous sperm donor from a fertility clinic. She found out her son was a boy at a late ultrasound and then moved across the country. Gave birth to him at home and then continued to move about until he was about like, mm, this old. It was just the two of them though. Like, they had contact with other people, but they really got close. Our storyteller had a lot of friends, but it was always supervised. But then, plot twist, so he's seven. A teacher spills something on him at school, he's gotta get changed, and suddenly the truth comes out. Can you imagine finding out you're not who you thought you were in the middle of a classroom? Absolutely not. School was miserable enough for me without that. So then, we got the cops getting involved. Social services. And just like that, our poor guy's whole world gets turned upside down. He's whisked away from his delusional mom and thrown into foster care faster than you can say gender identity crises. And as I'm sure you can guess, it's not a fun time for him. He goes from living as a girl to being forced into this rough and tumble foster home with a bunch of boys. He was forced to conform to boy stereotypes, short hair and all, and it hurt him. So after some really bad times that I can't go into detail about, he finally lands in a foster home that's like something out of a feel-good movie. They let him be himself, grow his hair, quit karate and football, he even takes up swimming and jazz dance. So fast forward a little bit, our guy comes out the other side with a healthy sense of self and an amazing wife by his side. He's living his best life now, but he can never talk about what he went through without feeling like he's living in some sort of twisted alternate reality. Poor schmuck. Don't worry, this next story isn't as sad. It's more along the lines of, I guess there's a kink for everything? Look, I perform as a pain-proof performer at freak shows, so I consider myself a pretty open-minded person. But every once in a while, there's something that I just need a minute for. So this is like something out of a horror movie crossed with a sci-fi thriller but with a major twist of, uh, let's just say not your typical fantasy. So get this, there's this guy who's been having these intense fantasies since high school about getting it on with a giant roach. 
Yep, a giant cockroach. And that all started when he read The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. I think this officially ties with my high school crush, who was a brony with people eating fantasies for a weirdest thing I've ever heard of. So, back to this guy before I start having nightmares. He starts imagining what it would be like if a woman turned into a roach. And not just anyone, this fully intelligent giant roach named Ugtha. Yeah, it, trust me, it gets weirder too. It gets to the point where he can't even get it up unless he's imagining doing the deed with Ugtha. Like he's so fixated on this roach fantasy that human women aren't doing it for him anymore. So he spills the beans to his girlfriend, thinking she'll understand, maybe try to work through it with them. Yeah, Lady Luck was not on this guy's side. She's straight up disgusted, outraged, and now he's freaking out, thinking she's gonna spill, thinking she's gonna spill the beans about his roach obsession to everybody and their grandma. He also feels guilty about feeling shame because he thinks Ugtha, this imaginary roach, is gonna be upset. Moral of the story here, maybe keep your fantasies to yourself unless you're sure your partner's into something similar. Once again, not shaming it, just not for everybody. How about I end today with a classic case of a uh, uh, Oedipus conflict. So this tale comes from a Reddit user who has since deleted his account, but I think the title of the post sums it up well enough. It reads, I am a man who had a schmexual relationship with his mother, probably NSFW. I swear if I'm not on a watch list already, talking about this is about to toss me on one, folks. Apparently when the author was in their teens, they were injured in an accident and became incapacitated. This caused them to go from pleasuring themselves twice a day to zero. And that, I guess, was the end of the world. Apparently after two weeks, they got frustrated, took it out on their parents, and unlike normal parents, these ones started talking about the possibility of Mommy Dearest helping Junior get off. One thing led to another, and Buddy Boy technically had a schmexual relationship with his mother. He said that he thinks that they would both characterize the experience as positive. Yeah, that about does it for this one before we get taken down. Riding in at number five, we have Motorcycle Insanity. Have you ever been driving along a long and winding road and noticed that the same car has been behind you for a very long time? On some roads this could be considered normal. If there's no place to turn off for a while and the speed is relatively well enforced, it would make sense that motorists spend a little extra time together. However, a lot of the time you'd expect someone stuck behind you to whip by at the earliest possible opportunity. This was not the case for Reddit user Lucky Giraffe during his lengthy encounter with a tailgater. Well, riding his motorcycle down an old country road, an ambulance was flying down the road in the opposite direction. Being a kind and generous member of society, he pulled off to the side, and so did the person behind him. Two dudes in a pickup truck rolled up, one hopped out wielding a baseball bat. That was the only warning our motorcyclist needed to get the fudge out of Dodge. For 20 minutes, these truck driving lunatics chased him. Being unfamiliar with the area and having a bike not meant for tricky maneuvers, Lucky Giraffe basically just hauled a for as long as he could. Running four way stops and dodging other cars, he eventually made it to the highway. This was the best possible scenario as motorcycles are well known for being able to go fast in straight lines. Why would someone pull up behind him and try to knock him silly? Well, likely so they could just beat him up and steal his bike. But to continue on for kilometers before watching him tear off down the highway requires an unsettling amount of determination. Backwoods Bike Busters man makes you think twice about stopping along any back road. Sneaking in at number four, the basement dweller. Usually this term makes me think of pasty dudes playing video games at their parents house. You know, most of my friends in high school. But this post by a reddit user gave the phrase a whole new terrifying meaning. The story tells the tale of a child visiting her grandparents house way back in the day. They and their cousins would play in the attached mother-in-law apartment while grown folks would chat in the main house. The kids carried on as kids do, playing silly games and running amok. Their play eventually evolved into a game of hot and cold in which they took turns hiding a little key they had found. A cousin with particularly buttery fingers dropped the key and it fell under the door to the basement. Now every kid knows that the basement is a spooky place and no one should willingly go down there unless totally necessary, or if it's a well established play area in the home. But against the unwritten rules of horror movies, our intrepid storyteller opened the door to go grab the key. They found a lot more than just a key. Standing at the bottom of the stairs was an unfamiliar man, arms full of stuff collected in the grandparents basement. When this strange vagrant saw our storyteller, he yelled, Go back upstairs, kid, go! And of course, the kid did. They told the adults who inspected the basement and came up with nothing. This made them think that it was just the kid's imagination. However, while cleaning up the house five years later, the dad did find out that the grandparents were missing plenty of stuff. This is a pretty terrifying scenario, don't you think? A stranger taking up residency in your own home without you even knowing? Snagging stuff and slipping in and out through some hidden entrance? I'd never go back, no questions asked. Number three, the orangutans are skeptical of the changes in their cages. I love how much that rhymes, by the way. So folks, you know the drill by now. This nightmare is thanks to Zachary Adams, and uh, let's just jump right into it. So we're gonna delve into the cryptic tale of a man caught in the web of his own perception. Kinda makes us, you know, 
come face to face with a surreal narrative that challenges the very fabric of reality. The protagonist in this one, a self-proclaimed clam in the grand scheme of existence, weaves a narrative around the mundane aspects of his life. His inability to discern change, a quirk of its psyche, becomes a lens through which we explore the unsettling twists of his reality. Now we meet a psychologist. He's seemingly benevolent god. And uh... Yeah, they kind of take on an eerie transformation, revealing layers of deception and manipulation that fracture the protagonist's understanding of his own existence. Now, the tale unfolds in disjointed revelations, with each layer peeling back to expose a more disconcerting truth, kind of like an onion. The courtroom, a bastion of justice, morphs into a surreal arena where the boundaries between guilt and innocence blur. The protagonist's journey through psychiatric evaluations become a descent into a labyrinth of distorted perceptions, where even the uh, physical environment becomes quite the enigma, if you will. The motif of stake. A seemingly trivial detail evolves into a symbol of existential dissonance. The protagonist's insistence on the routine comfort of steak serves as a poignant metaphor for the human desire to cling to familiarity in the face of an ever-shifting reality. But then we get a little twist. Steak was never truly what it seemed to be, and it kind of shatters the illusions of stability, leaving the protagonist grasping at the fragments of his own understanding. I'm not going to go into detail, but trust me, that twist got me. The psychologist's dual identity, donning disguises of both mentor and tormentor, mirrors a delicate dance between trust and betrayal that threads throughout the narrative. The laughter that echoes through the revelation of the protagonist's grim reality is a chilling crescendo, underscoring the fragility of the human, you know. Mind. As we traverse the corridors of the protagonist's mind, we are confronted with the unsettling notion that our perceptions, you know, like our realities, maybe they're veiled in layers of illusion. The casual interchange between the protagonist and the psychologist, you know, that's kind of full of cryptic references and uh, philosophical undertones, mirrors the style of a mind grappling with the complexities of its own existence. In the end, as the protagonist confronts the horrifying truth of his own conception, both literally and metaphorically, we're kind of left with a lingering sense of unease. This whole narrative, like, it kind of invites us to question the nature of reality and the fragility of our perceptions. In the words of Shel Silverstein, it's all the same to a clam, but for the protagonist, the revelation of his own reality is a harrowing journey into the depths of the unknown. Number two, I've listened to a true crime podcast about myself. So next up, we've got a scary story courtesy of one Robert Mort, which I love the name, you know, death, mort. Okay, that's my French coming out. So, we've all listened to podcasts, right? We love them, I have my favorites. But for this narrator, listening to it during a nightly stroll kind of transforms into quite a new reality. So, as they're immersing themselves in a true crime podcast, not my cup of tea, but do as you will, they realize, wait a minute, this sounds familiar. The podcast's ominous tale delivered with an eerie calmness begins to intertwine with the protagonist's reality, like with the small town, the local store, the young student, all elements that echoes the threads of their own existence. Like, okay, that's me, that's me. Is this a coincidence? The protagonist's emotional journey is palpable as the podcast delves into the mysterious disappearance of a girl named Sarah Campbell. The parallels between the podcast narrative and our protagonist's life become increasingly uncanny. It's like, okay, this has got to be me. Can't say I've ever had that happen yet, but yeah, who knows? The revelation that the victim shares the protagonist's name adds a layer of existential unease, as if the fabric of their own reality is unraveling faster than a ball of yarn. The narrative crescendos with the discovery of a pair of red Converse sneakers, mirroring the protagonist's own choice of footwear. Like for me, it'd be pink ankle boots. The podcast's ability to weave a tale that aligns so closely with the protagonist's experiences amplifies a sense of dread, inviting them and the audience to question the boundaries between fiction and reality. As the protagonist grapples with the unnerving possibility that the podcast is narrating their own story, the tension mounts. The arrival of a black SUV, the revelation of a registered offender named John Kelly, and the protagonist's frantic attempt to escape all of this contributes to the, uh, you know, the sense of impending danger. You know, that little yikes feeling in the back of your head? Also, the inclusion of Gabe, the protagonist's boyfriend, adds a twist that further blurs the line between, you know, hey, is this my life? Gabe's unexpected appearance in the podcast narrative, coupled, you know, with the revelation of a fabricated story about the protagonist's desire to run away, kind of shatters our narrator's sense of trust and stability. It's like, okay, well, game over for me. Now this podcast, with its hypnotic storytelling and ominous foreshadowing, becomes a malevolent force, seemingly orchestrating the protagonist's fate. The disconcerting blend of podcast narration and real life events creates a narrative hall of mirrors, where truth and illusion are kind of dancing together in a haunting tandem. Now our protagonist tries to escape through a window at this point, fueled by a desperate need to distance themselves from the encroaching darkness. And it leaves the audience suspended in an unsettling denouement, if you will. Number one, I just took a DNA test. Turns out I'm 100% in over my head. Look, I'm not the biggest fan of the concept of big companies owning part of my DNA. So while I didn't need the story from Sleepy Hollow 101 to scare me, maybe it'll chill some of y'all. So, once again, in today's day and age, who hasn't bought an Ancestry DNA kit, apparently? Well, for this narrator, a seemingly innocent decision to explore their genetic makeup kind of unfolded into a perplexing tale that challenges, yeah, you guessed it, 
reality. So I began, you know, they bought their test, promising insight into their heritage and the possibility to connect with long lost kin. Because, you know, who needs another cousin? It kind of takes a bit of a turn though when the option to share DNA data with law enforcement materializes. A choice made with, you know, a noble intention to aid in solving crimes and bringing justice to victims, but little does the storyteller anticipate the crazy web that's going to unravel as a consequence of this seemingly innocent decision. The revelation that the storyteller's DNA is a partial match to an unidentified deceased woman kind of thrusts them into a, uh, you know, situation where the we're kind of like, what the heck? The quest to identify this Jane Doe leads to a disconcerting revelation that the DNA match points to the storyteller's own family member, Bex. The ensuing discovery of two more exact matches to additional Jane and John Doe's compounds the mystery, creating a tapestry of inexplicable connections. Now, our storyteller grapples with the surreal nature of these revelations, seeking logical explanations that elude even the investigators. The absolute absurdity of the situation is magnified by the nonchalant response of Bex and Aunt Linda, who dismiss the DNA matches with laughter and shrugged shoulders, kind of making us go, uh-huh. As the narrative unfolds, the disappearance of Bex, Ethan, and Aunt Linda adds another layer of complexity to the conundrum. Now, our storyteller, caught in a bewildering whirlwind of events, oscillates between waiting for their return and the gnawing realization that the fabric of their family might be woven with the threads of quite the mystery. Now, the police are equally as confounded by all of this and the disappearances, so they turn to the storyteller for any kind of information that might help. And the family's account of a prolonged vacation and the lack of substantial leads, yeah, the investigation kind of takes a turn. So in this crazy story, the boundaries, once again, between the reality and the inexplicable kind of turn into a gray area, leaving the storyteller and us suspended in, you know, limbo. The quest for ancestral knowledge transforms into a chilling exploration of the unknown, where the threads of family history become kind of intertwined with a cosmic riddle that defies the conventions of reason. Now, as the narrative concludes, the unresolved mystery lingers, casting a shadow over the storyteller's quest for identity. The enigma of the DNA matches and the vanishing of family members kind of remains shrouded in ambiguity. Kicking off at number five, the recurring dream. And this story from Reddit user Just Another Gamer is a visceral and horrifying reminder that lingering in the deep recesses of the human mind are some truly perplexing chemical reactions that we can't even begin to comprehend. Have you ever had a recurring dream? Ever thought, what the hell is this all about? What does it mean? Wow, yeah, this person is still asking the same question. As the story goes, Just Another Gamer is an avid cave diver, and since about the age of six, they explored the unknown caverns across Florida. When they were around seven or eight years old, they started to have a strange recurring dream. In the dream, they were exploring a cave and made their way through a little hole in the bottom. Inside was a 10 to 15 foot long corridor, a few feet in height, and a bent red stop sign at the end, like someone had ripped it off and tossed it inside. As they'd make their way through the corridor, it started descending, quickly opening into a large vertical chamber with a path leading down in a corkscrew pan. Then things would get blurry, but they'd remember the image of trash scattered around the walls, things writhing in the distance, strange things, animals and corpses maybe. Amidst them, they'd see their own family, each one of them being tortured and killed, but in the dream, all they could do was scream. Our narrator had this dream for years and years, always the same thing, until seven or eight years later, when they were around 15, they went on a caving trip with their father, a place called Dog Drop out in the Tampa Bay area. Well, when they were descending on a 30 foot rappel, they felt a strange, familiar feeling. When they reached the bottom and looked up, they saw the exact same corridor from their dream. The same strange clutters of trash against the wall, the same red stop sign. Instantly, they were hit with this overwhelming sense of nausea and primal fear, and they froze. All they could do is scream to leave, and eventually, their father paid attention to them and packed up their things to leave. Whatever was lurking down there, our narrator knew that it wasn't good. They'd seen it before, deep in the recesses of their own memory, and thankfully, they never found out. Coming in at number four, the boat mechanic. And this short and sweet story comes from Two Otters in a Coat, which is a fantastic name, may I add. Telling the real life tale about a guy that they knew who made their living working as a boat mechanic. Now, random acts of violence are a different kind of fear, but this one, takes it to a whole new level. As the story goes, one Saturday, their friend, the boat mechanic, was working alone in their workshop, making some final repairs to a boat that had been brought in. Suddenly, out of nowhere, 
the mechanic wakes up and he's on the ground. Now he knew that there was water beneath him just before he's working on a boat so he assumed that he'd been electrocuted and the shock had knocked him away unconsciously. The strangest part is that he could vaguely sense someone behind him so he started yelling for help letting them know that he'd been electrocuted. Whoever was behind him turned and left without a word. He keeps screaming for help until eventually a neighbouring business heard his pleas and came to his aid. Later on though, once he'd been seen by the nearby hospital, he discovered from the police that he wasn't electrocuted at all. According to the police, someone had entered his workshop while he was working and hit him on the back of the head with a mallet from his own toolbox and nothing was stolen from the shop. Now this person was never caught and CCTV wasn't clear enough to identify the perp, but as it seems they were walking by and spontaneously decided to knock him out, potentially with the intention of killing him, for seemingly no reason whatsoever. Now that's terrifying. Popping out at number three, we have a secret room. This tale gave me Channel Zero and Silence of the Lambs vibes. Never enough WTF says they're a construction inspector. While looking at a house about to be renovated, they noticed a hidden room behind a bookcase. It wouldn't have even been found if not for a strange relationship between the foundation of the house and the main floor. Being the excellent inspector they are, Never Enough WTF peeked into the secret space. It was a small room, about 80 square feet, sporting a single fluorescent light covered in steel grating. The floor and walls were covered in sheet vinyl and the only furniture in the room was a metal chair and in the floor, a single drain. Torture room, anyone? The folks looking to renovate ended up tearing the whole thing down, which was probably the right call. Nobody wants to live in a house with whatever the hell that room was. What do you think was happening in there? Give me your best guesses in the comments. Gliding in at number two, we've got a floating mystery. I think the unknowable aspect of this story is the scariest part. Our hero in this Ask Reddit regaling was driving around a mid-sized town in Florida late one Saturday night. Used to seeing plenty of folks out and about near a popular bar, they were a little weirded out to see that the streets were essentially empty. Even with a little light drizzle, there would usually be folks out for a smoke or a fight. Instead, on this dark weekend eve, there was one lone woman. The storyteller was stopped at a red light when they saw her and noticed that she was looking up at something in the night sky. Weird, right? So the light turns green and the motorist keeps driving. They pass the woman who never stops looking up at whatever the hell they were looking at. This is passed off as drunk and or high behavior and a person zoning out while staying skyward. But then a few blocks down the road, there's a man doing the exact same thing, looking 45 degrees up at some unknowable thing in the sky. And based on their calculations, it met with the gaze of the girl four blocks away. So somehow these strangers have fixated on the same thing from blocks away and find it so transfixing that they can't look away. Unmoving, unblinking, unaccompanied. This driver never got a good look at what was above them, but reported feeling absolutely unsettled. And finally at number one, a camping trip nightmare. Back to some realism for this last one, and it is a tragic and terrifying story. Relayed to Reddit user ya boy Henry Clay by his friend's father, it tells the tale of some friends gone missing in the worst possible way. When the dad and his friends were around 17 years old, they decided to take a camping trip together. About eight of them went out to the Wisconsin woods and split the cost of one campsite. When they arrived, they divided the group to go grab some firewood and then meet back at the original location shortly thereafter. One of the pairs didn't make it back right away, but as they were a couple, the friends just assumed they were off bumping uglies. Jokes were made and everyone started to set up camp. A few hours later, the couple still wasn't back, so the group went off in search of them. A scrap of bloody shirt and a pair of shoes were found, prompting the friends to rush to their car in order to report what had happened. However, when they made it to the vehicle, they found that the gas had been siphoned, meaning they had to walk to the ranger's office. During their walk to the office, a semi-truck passed by with one driver and two faces pressed up to the window. They believed that it was their friends attempting to get help. Both were reported missing and have not been found. And that's the kind of story that makes you want to board up your house and never leave. It's a reminder that things can go south super quickly, so be careful, stay prepared, and watch your friends' backs. Coming in at number five, bug-eyed. We love a good pun from time to time, but this one might just stick with me for the rest of my life. As a person who's worked at swimming pools and summer camps, I've seen all sorts of different stuff get into people's eyes, from sticks, rocks, chlorinated water, bird droppings, and of course, bugs. Hell, I had a gnat fly into my eye while I was biking just last week. But these are all things that can be removed relatively easily if you're careful. 
They're not trying to make a home in your ocular orb. This story from Reddit user Oscar Divine makes me want to scream and you're about to find out why. It goes like this. I've told this story before. I'm an eye doctor and I had a patient come to me with an infected eyelid two other eye doctors tried to treat and failed. They were dumping all sorts of medicine into it and it wasn't getting any better. At this point it was swollen and painful for weeks with no improvement despite being on tons of meds. Apparently neither of them thought to flip the lid upside down, you know the gross trick that some kids do with their upper eyelids. It was a painful maneuver for her very swollen eyelid which might explain it. Anyhow, there appeared to be what looked like a visible abscess inside the tissue with thick gooey material. I thought I'd give it a nudge and I saw it move. This wasn't an abscess, it was something else. I managed to remove it quite easily in one whole piece. It was a fly larva. The patient told me that she had a bug hit her in the eye a few days before she got this infection. I removed the larva and within two days the wound closed and she was 100% recovered on basic antibiotic eye drops. Yes, I do have the photos for this case for those interested. I mean, I for one. I'm not interested. Walking around with a larva in your eyelid for weeks and not bothering to figure out what it actually was? What if it was like wriggling around in there? What if it decided to start crawling around and looking for food? This is the kind of body horror I would expect in a movie, not real life. Although what is real life if not horror? Let's keep moving. Coming in at number 4, we've got some unwelcome tenants. This is a personal fear of mine played out right before someone's very eyes. The idea of a silent, sneaky, and altogether uninvited individual deciding that the nooks and crannies of my home are free real estate just drives me nuts. And the worst bit is you're living in blissful ignorance of this until something finally sticks out and other patterns reveal themselves. Those bumps in the night? That wasn't the house settling or whatever other explanation your grandmother might have given you, that was a squatter moving moving around in the dark. All that food seemingly going missing. It sure wasn't partially forgotten midnight snacks or your friends being greedy if you know what I'm saying. Those times the motion sensing lights went off in the middle of the night. Mm -mm. Not mice, raccoons, or squirrels. Boy oh boy. User Iems85 told their tale in a thread about this particular occurrence. For about a year I lived in a house with four housemates. We had a pretty big backyard with a garage and a tool shed that we never used, ever. We also had motion detector lights. Two of my housemates were very superstitious and believed in ghosts and spirits and such. They also liked to get high on different substances. The lights in our backyard would go off randomly. I assumed it was animals, my housemates were sure it was a ghost. One of them told us she'd seen a man ghost looking through our window when she was high on shrooms. They thought it was scary, I thought nothing of it because, well, yeah. A few nights later, drunk me thought I saw a man through the mesh door to the backyard. I just thought my mind was playing tricks on me because my housemates kept talking about the ghost. Eventually I moved out to go back to my home country and about 6 months after that I facetimed with one of the housemates. Turns out we hadn't seen a ghost. A homeless man had been living in our tool shed for god knows how long. Gave me the creeps for sure. All this happening pre-pandemic is horrific, right? But imagine it happening now. You're always home and they have smaller windows to get out of their hiding spot. What if somebody died while in your home because they couldn't get enough food or couldn't get outside and you didn't even know until you smelled something funny? That's not an experience I ever want to have. Next up at number 3, the closet. This story comes from Tighty Whitey's 37 which is yeah. As the story goes, back in 2002 they were living in an old apartment that had been built back in the year 1900, making it just over 100 years old when they moved in. Now everything in the apartment was great apart from one thing, the bedroom, and in particular the closet in the bedroom which gave them the unnerving feeling that someone or something was watching them when it was left ajar. So much so that when this particular reddit user was sleeping they'd often hear strange gasping noises and it would seem that they were coming from within the closet. They'd check, nothing there but for that reason the closet would always stay closed. A month or so of them staying in the apartment there was a loud bang on the closet door one night and our narrator was woken from their sleep. It was pitch black yet they sensed something that emerged from the closet standing over them, a pressure holding them down in their bed. And yeah, you could explain this away with sleep paralysis, but the end of this story may just make you think twice. Throughout their stay at the apartment, the encroaching sense of dread from the closet had never quite left, and even their friends would comment on the strange feeling that they felt when in the vicinity of the closet. It got so bad that eventually they had the chance to move to another unit, so they jumped at the opportunity, packed their stuff up, and got the hell out of there. Well, a few years later, the owners were renovating the building when our narrator was walking past the doorway of their old apartment. 
apartment. Curiously, they caught the building manager who was painting in the bedroom and began talking about the strange feeling that they felt whilst living there. Without thinking twice, the building owner explained that the former tenant of the apartment had committed suicide. They'd hang themselves in the closet. And not only that, but the original designer of the building, who had also stayed in the same apartment, had also committed suicide. They'd hanged themselves in the exact same closet. Swinging in at number two, the baby upstairs. And this story comes from Reddit user UrgeHouse666, spooky name bud, who explains an incredibly strange moment during their teenage years. As the tale goes, when they were in high school, their uncle would throw them a couple of bucks every now and then to babysit his kids with their aunt. But they lived in a beautiful old two-story house by the water in a nice area, and the two children were around three and six. One day, our narrator was sitting in the den scrolling through their phone when they started to hear a baby crying. Of course, it must be the three-year-old distressed upstairs, so doing their babysitting duty, they headed to check on them. They called out a couple of times while heading upstairs to no response. They called for their aunt to see if she was dealing with it, no response again. When they turned to start walking up the stairs, they caught a glimpse outside in the yard. It was their aunt with her two children laughing and playing on the grass. They heard the babies cry again, the noise coming from upstairs, and all of the hairs on our narrator's body stood on end, a chill running down their spine. Quietly, they turned around, walked down the stairs, got in their car and drove away. The baby was still crying when they closed the door behind them. A few years later, our narrator was drunk at a family party and they mustered the courage to tell their uncle the story. He said that him and his wife used to hear the baby too crying when no one else was around. According to him, the previous owners had a small child that had died of cot death in the same room that the cries were coming from. Spooky stuff. And finally, coming in at our number one spot, the attic. And again, another tale of spooky kids in upstairs locations. Sorry, I hope that wasn't a spoiler. This story comes from Reddit user Ghouls, who tells the tale of the time that they'd moved into their new childhood home. You see, their family had managed to snag a deal because previously the house was used as a model home to show off the housing design of the surrounding area. Upstairs, it had this loft area that had two stairwells that attached to it on either end, one in the front and one in the back. You could pretty much hear everything from up there as it was so open. Anyway, one day our narrator and their two friends, a guy and a girl, were hanging out in the loft. It was high school, so teenagers being teenagers, the pair were pretty handsy. They were watching TV, all snuggled together on the sofa, when our narrator got up to take a leak. When they got back, the two of them were on completely different ends of the couch, their faces drained of all colour. Our narrator asked them what was up, and the guy said, your little sister is home. Instantly, our narrator's face went white as a sheet. What's wrong? The girl asked. You see, our narrator didn't have a little sister and he asked them what made them think he did. They replied that they'd heard her and then they'd seen her, but for all they knew, no one was in the house. To this day, our narrator's two best friends swear that they heard a little girl laugh and run up the stairs, hitting her hand on each step like she was running up on all fours like kids do. As it turned out, before it was a model home, a family had lived there and their young daughter had been playing upstairs in the loft. She'd climbed a railing, slipped and fell to her death and no one thought to mention that fact when they were flipping the house. No wonder they got such a good deal. Kicking off at number five, we've got the lost military exercise. A lot of unexplainable stuff seems to happen to those in the military. Whether it's genuinely paranormal or just a mix of fear and adrenaline, we'll never really know. But this story is a little different from Reddit user I Love Pink Nips. <laughs> Back when he was back in the army, his squad ran into something pretty unexplainable during a regular navigation exercise. It was a standard drill, they were given a map and some coordinates, and they had to find certain checkpoints along the way using only a compass and a GPS backup in case of emergency. Everything was going swimmingly, but as they were nearing the end of the exercise, a squad had fallen hopelessly behind and were finally making their way to the last checkpoint. Our narrator was in charge of the last checkpoint and knew that the squad was close by in at least a one kilometer range radius, but they couldn't yet see them due to the dense foliage. Well, he waited there for over two hours, still no sign. He radioed them, 
No response. Half an hour later, they frantically radioed back. They were lost, walking around in circles, seeing the exact same landmarks. They reported that it was pitch black, but our narrator could see that it was still light out. It was barely 6 pm and the sun was only starting to set. Well, they emergency buzzed their coordinates and they headed to their exact location, but there was no one there. Nothing. The forest was eerily quiet. No birds, no insects just dead silence. It turned out that the squadron didn't actually emerge until several hours later. They reported that they felt like they were being followed the whole time. They kept leaving knife marks on nearby trees to guide their way, but every time they came back, the mark had disappeared. Spooky, eh? Coming in at number four, Nick at Night. We all remember Nick at Night, right? Late night cartoons that were pure amazing. Well, Reddit user Saint Sparkles had some pretty awesome parents who let them sleep in the living room on weekend nights, chill out on the couch, and watch Nick at Night until they fell asleep. So one night during this most joyous of weekend treats, Saint Sparkles woke up on the sofa with a strange prickly feeling. It was like an instinct, something tugging at their sleeve saying, wake up, something's not quite right. Well, they bolted upright in a sitting position and their eyes quickly fixed on the front window. You see, our narrator lived in rural Georgia and there was a hell of a lot of trees surrounding their property. In the perfect light cast from the moon, they could see a strange silhouette or a person, perhaps a creature, something standing in the tree outside their home. Their dog seemed to sense it too and quickly dashed to the window, snarling at the glass. Long story short, their parents heard the commotion. Dad flipped out and grabbed the gun, headed out into the forest, screaming, get off my property. He found no one though, and St. Sparkles quickly went back to their bedroom to sleep. Just as they were dozing off though, their gaze cast out of their bedroom window. The figure, it's there again, this time standing in a tree closer to the house. Whatever it was, he put a finger over his mouth and shushed, and then just like that, turned away and ran. Yikes. Coming in number three, we've got Puss Brain. Not two words you really want to see together, right? Well, just listen to this story from user Slappy McSlappenstein. It speaks for itself. When I worked in healthcare, I had a patient who got a sinus infection. He stopped taking his antibiotics after a few days because he felt better. His sinus infection came back with a vengeance. When he got to the emergency department, he was presenting with stroke symptoms. The infection had spread to his cranial cavity. There was so much pus that it was twisting his brain. No one thought he would survive the surgery. The family was advised to expect the worst, but amazingly, he actually survived. He ended up needing three more surgeries to wash out and spent almost two months in the hospital. So take your full dose of antibiotics, people. How are we feeling about this one? A little, little headache? Checking in on your sinus health? Because that is absolutely bonkers. This dude essentially had to have a brain enema because of the filth built up in his dome. That stuff comes back with a vengeance, like he said, if you're not careful. So listen to your local healthcare worker and finish your antibiotics regimen. Coming in at number two, we've got the suffocation stage. In a lot of creepypasta stories, folks who are left near some dangerous chemical or enclosed space often go mad. You know, self mutilation, murder, hideous mutations, the works. In this story, though, the folks put in an unsafe situation don't end up doing a whole lot of that. They just die, and they die quick. We live in a cruel world, and if the folks running companies aren't careful or tend to cut corners, a lot of bad stuff can happen. Take it from Reddit user Animator Spaminator. I heard this from my grandpa. He used to work in the oil slash gas industry. His father actually owned the company. Anyways, they had these huge tanks full of some deadly gas that's heavier than oxygen. Some guy went down to measure the size of the tank, suffocated, and died. Another guy found him at the bottom, wanted to help him, and he went down after him, suffocated, died after falling off the ladder down. Third guy does the same. Eventually, my grandpa finds three dead bodies at the bottom of a large tank, all having suffocated on this toxic gas. They have vents in these tanks now, which is good. Yeah, the poor grandpa. Imagine strolling into work and discovering not one, not two, but three dead bodies. All because of an invisible assailant that robbed the oxygen from their lungs. And finally, at number one, we've got the Outback Backpack Killer. If I was ever to visit Australia, I would be on the lookout for killer animals, bugs, and temperatures. In fact, killer people probably wouldn't even cross my mind. However, as this story shows us, murderous lunatics can be anywhere at any time. User Passometer has this story to tell. I met a guy who had been traveling Australia with a couple friends, hitchhiking around as many of us have done. One of his friends told him that they were near his distant uncle's house, whom he 
never met before. He got a phone number from a family member, and as they had hoped, the uncle offered them a place to stay. He picked them up in town and drove them out to his rural property way out in the bush. They said he seemed like a pretty normal guy, friendly and cheery. When it was time to set up a place to sleep, the uncle took them to a closet that was totally full of sleeping bags and bedrolls. They didn't think much of it at the time and all grabbed the kit and set up on the living room floor. They stayed a couple days and nothing out of the ordinary happened, but afterwards the uncle drove them to the bus station and they continued on their way. About a year later, the man was arrested and charged with several counts of murder. He was the man who was picking up young hitchhiking backpackers and slaughtering them. The guy who told me this story was 100% certain he had slept in the sleeping bag of one of his victims. And now this guy has to walk around for the rest of his life with the knowledge that he slept in a death sleeping bag. Definitely the kind of story that ends up as the central focus of a true crime podcast. Number five, the brother's visitor. First up on our list, this one comes from username Florionizer. Good name. I was about seven years old, my brother about 10, which is the same age difference as me and my older brother, so already I'm creeped out. My brother and my mom had a habit of waking up in the middle of the night to use the washroom. I always knew this because I was a light sleeper and they just couldn't help but keep the door wide open when they flushed. Pause. Do they open it and then flush or is it open the whole time? Cause um, gross? So one night my brother stopped on his way to his bedroom and said, you know what, I'm gonna try and pee before I go to bed. The past few nights I've been too afraid to walk to the bathroom. I keep seeing a man wearing stripes at the end of the hallway. And I don't know if my mom wrote it off as my brother telling me ghost stories and to try and scare me, or if she was already half asleep and didn't catch it. But she didn't react at all to my brother's confession. On the other hand, I was terrified of it. As you should be, my friend, as you should be. If anyone said that to me, I'd be like, hey, we're either gonna fight or we're gonna go kill some demons right now. Years later, when I was about 18, my mom and I were having a conversation in her car about a dog we had for a very short time when I was little. We were sharing stories about the dog's tendency towards destroying my shoes and other unruly behaviors when my mom blurted out, do you remember the time I opened the front door for the cops and the dog ran inside of the kitchen and started tearing open the big bag of dog food we had? This really caught me by surprise because in all the years that I lived in that house, we never once called the cops. So I asked her what she she was talking about and she looked equally as surprised. Oh, she says, that's right, I never told you because you were too young at the time. One night I woke up hearing noises outside of my window and when I looked, I saw a man staring into my bedroom. She went on to describe how turning on the lights caused him to take off running and how she grabbed my dad's pistol before calling the cops. I can't remember all the details I gave them when they showed up, she says. Tall white male wearing a striped shirt of some sort and jeans, short dark hair, something like that. They said it matched the description of a man they were looking for in the air Area. It turns out he had escaped from jail on a murder charge. The guy continues to say that although reading it like this, it may seem pretty obvious, but it wasn't until a few years ago that he realized his brother had unknowingly warned us about a murderer who spent multiple nights casing their house. This is scary twice, okay? The fact that this kid saw what he thought was a ghost, and then it wasn't even a ghost, it was a guy, it was a murderer of all people. No way, that's nuts. This actually happened to me when I was home alone once, when I was a young little, little tailor tot, you know? My grandma was there in the basement, but like, I don't know how good her right hooks are, so. I was sitting on the computer in my computer room, and I look to my right, and I see this dude like wearing all black hoodie, like trench coat, like couldn't see his face, it was so dark. So I home alone it. I just pretended like I was talking to somebody in the other room without actually saying anything out loud. But I got too scared when the dude didn't move, so I just started running in my socks. And then I told my grandma, and we called the cops together. And then we ate Werther's Originals. It was great, good bonding time with Gam Gam. Honestly, man, that is so scary. I'm so sorry you had to go through that at Floor and I's Number four, bar trouble. This one is coming in hot from user KennyC5567. One time I went to the bar with one of my friends. I had just turned 21, so I hadn't really been to bars that much yet. My friend and I were drinking on the way to the bar, so he was already pretty drunk. Ah, the classic pre-drink walk. Get those last couple of white claws in, yeah? When we got there, we sat at a bar and this cute girl came up and talked to my friend and I. This girl was flirting with me and my friend. She could tell that my friend was already pretty drunk. And to be honest, I played along like I was drunk too, since it seemed to be working for my friend. I didn't really know she was trying to get free drinks, so I told her we don't have much money. We're not trying to pop off tonight. She offered to buy us drinks. Okay. She kept buying us drinks over and over, and I started to get confused as to who she liked between me and my friend. Classic scenario. My friend 
him went to the bathroom, but before he came back, he was kicked out by the bouncers. He was too drunk. Eh, we've all been there, man. Just go fire up some Fortnite, order some junior chickens. We'll get him next time, my dude. It's all good. Candace, that was her name. Candace and I went outside with him. She kept telling him to go home with her, and he was so out of it that he could barely answer her. So I told her, hey, you know, he's too drunk. I can't let him go anywhere like this. I didn't want him to wake up hungover in some random house with no car, and more importantly, no idea what happened. Candace kept pushing it, saying that she would take care of him. But I told her no, because I had to stay with him. I was more sober than him at this time, so he was my responsibility. He said the only way his friend is going is if he tags along. She had immediately started flirting with me at that point and offered to get my friend a taxi to drive home and said we can go back to her place. Now at this point I'd had a few drinks and I was pretty buzzed, not drunk, so I agree. We get in her car and the vibe feels off. She offers to stop at a liquor store on the way to her house to get more to drink, even offering to buy all of it. I told her I was drunk enough, but she insisted. I said to grab some liquor, but have some apple juice to chase it down. I feel like orange juice would have been better than apple juice, I don't know. Ugh. So I started to act more drunk than I was, purposely calling her the wrong name, yet she didn't react to it. Okay, that's a telltale sign. She just kept letting me call her Carla. She helped me walk inside and I purposely tripped into her front door. She took me inside still, closed the door and locked it. I went to the washroom, looked at the mirror and I could feel myself getting more and more drunk from that last minute liquor stop that we did. So I turn on the sink and I try and make myself puke. The old pull the trigger, nice, we've all been there. Maybe we haven't, some of us have. You know who you are. Then I hear her voice talking to somebody saying, he's drunk as hell, he can barely stand up. You do it. So I walked out and she quickly hurried out of the dark living room to her bedroom. She came back and said, let's go to my room. And I looked at her bright red hair, because I remembered that, and then into her eyes. They were different. Her face was different. It was another girl with the same hair wig, evidently. So I went back to the washroom and apologized for being so drunk on the way. This time I heard her whispering and a male voice whispered back. I didn't concentrate. This was sketchy and I had to get the hell out of there. Yes, now we're talking. So I opened the bathroom window and jumped straight out and ran faster than I ever have in my entire life. I ran through yards until I saw a street and then ran down that street to CVS, waited in front of the cameras and then called the taxi and went home. With so many questions, I went back the next day with friends just to check it out. Turns out it was a summer rental house and somebody had broken in that night. That is insane. What if this guy and his friend went back? What if they both went back? How many people were there? What the hell were they about to do to this guy? That's so scary. How many wigs? What? So many questions. I'm glad both those guys didn't go through with that. I would have left long before that. Next up at number three, Odd House. This one is equal parts charming and insanely unnerving. So let me know what you think in the comments down below. Reddit user Memory Eater painted a beautiful picture of their childhood home in a time gone ass Reddit thread from four years ago. As a child, they lived in a bizarre little house. It was incredibly tall and thin, full of quirks like two fully functioning fireplaces, a weird shower in the basement, and an old timey rope pulled dumbwaiter that led from the kitchen to their bedroom. The fact that it was incredibly old also meant that it was falling apart and in short was a complete money sink. So their parents sold the house and they had to move. As Memory Eater was cleaning out their closet, they stumbled across something that they'd never noticed before. A strange attic entrance to their walk-in wardrobe. Of course, being an adventurous kid, they opened it up and headed up a strange set of steps. The first thing that they noticed was that it wasn't as dark as it should have been. The place was strung with weird red Christmas lights that seemed to have been recently lit. There was also a bed the place seemed lived in, an old gurney piled with sleeping bags and sheets, and bizarrely a small mint coloured fridge which still worked. The strangest thing though was the bones. A lot of bones, heaped in piles in the corner, small, large, clean and white, scattered throughout the small room. Two of them had been burnt black, and scrawled on the wall was a dark coloured bone charred message, the word sorry over and over again. Someone had been sleeping over their head for eight years and what the hell, this is insanity. Well, they never found out who or what it was. Swinging in at number two, something at sea. Yeah, this one is pretty damn weird. True or no, I don't know, but it's creepy as hell. Again, another military story. Told you weird stuff always happens to them. This one comes from Reddit user Engerby. The story reportedly takes place roughly around a year ago while on board the USS New York, operating somewhere remotely in the Atlantic. They were staging a mock military exercise with half the crew posing as pirates and the other seizing possession of their ship. Well, as their squad was heading out on a small boarding vessel, things got a little bit weird and a thick fog descended on 
their position. It was only meant to be a short five minute ride to their destination, but over 10 minutes had passed at this point and they still hadn't hit. They were lost in the middle of nowhere, as if they'd fallen asleep and ended up miles completely off course. Eventually, after the engine had cut out already once before, they came across a massive old rusted ship, like a cruise liner that had been pulled from the bottom of the ocean. Of course, they boarded it, but inside they found something even stranger. They found reams and reams of books, sketches of some kind in notepads, of creatures that weren't supposed to exist. Massive marine animals, twisted squids, ungodly whales, and a note. These are what I have observed on my 14 month journey. Well, of course, they quickly got the hell out of there, and for fear of sounding insane, they refused to report it to their superior officers. Well, Worst things have happened at sea, eh? And finally, at our number one spot, my favorite ever Reddit story, sticky notes. Not exactly a horror story, but so much more potentially terrifying. Three years ago, Reddit user rbradbury1920 posted to the legal advice subreddit about a strange series of events that had recently plagued him. It first began when he found a yellow sticky note in a handwriting that wasn't his own on his desk at home, reminding him to run some personal errands, but hadn't told anybody about. Very odd, but he chalked it up to something that he'd done in his sleeping state, half awake. A few days later, he found another sticky note in the exact same handwriting, telling him to make sure he'd saved his documents. He freaked out this time, but there were no signs of a break in and no signs of criminal intent. The next time, he found another post it note saying, Our landlord isn't letting me talk to you, but it's important we do. What the hell? Well, he was convinced that it was his landlord, playing games with him, breaking into his apartment. He found a letter from when he first moved in, and the handwriting was seemingly identical to his landlord's. The big twist? Well, Reddit user Kakalak pretty much saved this guy's life. In the comments, after a thorough analysis of the situation, he concluded that his apartment was leaking carbon monoxide, and he was correct. Our Reddit user had been suffering from slow carbon monoxide poisoning and was experiencing hallucinations that led to him writing sticky notes to himself. If it would have continued, in all likelihood, he could have ended up dead. So. Good job, Kakalak. Coming in at five, the Tinder date. Uploaded to r slash no sleep by small dog on desk. Great name. They explain their strange Tinder date that may have led to a stalking. I quote, I think my Tinder date is stalking me. I swear. I don't know what to do because I can't prove it. I can smell him in my home. The putrid stench of grease and third world sewers mixed with body odor. My apartment has absolutely reeked for days. I haven't gone in except to pick up clean clothes and drop off old ones. I first noticed the smell when I came back from our date alone. The smell was faint, barely there. For a moment I thought it was my asthma of garbage coming from the open bathroom window. When I closed it, the city scum stuck to my skin. Like the rest of my life, the date had gone just wrong. Gerald, he was strange, he looked like his pictures except that Gerald was greasy. No, he was certifiably oily. His hair looked like it was smeared with a slick, almost dripping pomade, and his skin had a suspicious rainbow sheen, like oil on water. His voice matched the rest of him, sleazy, oozing, cystic. I was instantly turned off. Embarrassingly, I was on Tinder because I had no friends. I can see why, judge much. I had just moved to a middle sized industrial city in Southeast Asia for my company six month overseas industrial attachment. My colleagues were all middle aged and I was absolutely craving for some under 30 interaction. I swiped right on Gerald about two weeks ago. An empty profile but lots of pictures. He seemed normal enough, cute in the tall lean sort of way. That said, I won't deny that the idea of having a local boy take me around made the idea of six months in the middle of basically an industrial nowhere somewhat powerful. When Gerald stood up, he left a slick gloss on the seat. I dropped half of my bill, mumbled something about work, and ran off into the cab that had been waiting for me. I tipped him an extra 20 to wait. I don't remember what was talked about during our date, I do remember seeing him through the window of the restaurant. His eyes were slimy, roving, watching me leave. He texted me in the cab asking for another date, I politely declined, but his replies, not so congenial. The smell. It was the smell that made me decide to leave. It was still faint then, just a lingering scent, but it made me me nervous, a primal uncomfortable feeling of something that was not quite right. I threw some clothes into my gym duffel, then called a cab to the closest holiday inn. That was about half a week ago. The texts had been coming in once every few hours. I ignore them now. Last night I went to my apartment to get 
more clothes. The smell soaked the front door, spilling into the corridor. I smelled it the moment my lift opened. It grew stronger as I approached the apartment. My doorknob gleamed. It was polished, rubbed raw by scrabbling hands. I didn't need to touch it to know that it would be oily, that it would be putrid. I rushed back to the safety of the hotel, the safety of other people. I sat in the lobby for hours, basking in the fading chatter of tourists, the glow of the ceiling lamps, breathing, just breathing. The desk staff looked at me oddly, but no one said anything. My legs tingled when I stood up. I was exhausted. I staggered. Lobby, lift, corridor, bedroom, bed. I was just sinking into the mattress when I noticed it. The smell of faint, rotting oil. I rubbed the fingers of my right hand together. When did they get covered in grease? Whew. Okay, I'll say that the scariest part of this story initially was the girl's judgement. She tore in and she tore hard. Respect. However, the ending definitely gave me chills. Coming in at 4, the man in the apartment. Posted to r slash no sleep by reality subsides, they said, I quote, There's a tiny man living in my apartment. He roams around when I'm there, moving from place to place, but I can never actually look at him. I'll see him out of the corner of my eye, sitting on a counter, kneeling on the floor, always looking at me, but as soon as my eyes start in his direction, turns out it was just a lamp or a shoe or a cup. He's just always in my peripheral vision. I didn't see him often when I first moved in. I'd occasionally notice a strange shape in the corner, but after looking over, would always pass it off as my imagination. It's my leaning backpack. It's just the garbage can. I tell myself that I was just tired or hungry or drunk. I never really thought about it, then I began to see him more and more often. He began to take shape to be immediately recognizable. What used to be a vague black shape became something with color, definition, depth. What I used to be able to shrug off as nothing became something real, something ominous. He began to have a presence. I'd still look over, always with the same result, always trying to convince myself I was just seeing things. Eventually I couldn't ignore it anymore. There was something there, it wasn't my mind. He used to startle me, now he terrifies me. The innocent, silly realization of, oh, I thought that stack of newspapers was a person is gone. Now he's grown an anonymous presence, replaced with a heavy feeling of dread. I've started to see him always. He never leaves, he's always sitting there, in the shadows, in my peripheral vision watching me. Sometimes I'll try to ignore him for long stretches of time. I won't look over at him. I won't acknowledge him. I'll just pretend I don't see him sitting over there, staring at me. I'll just go on about my business. This is when he began screaming. The first time it happened, I was sitting on my couch watching TV. I could see him in the corner, standing there, staring at me, but I tried to ignore him. I tried to drown him out with the television, turning it up louder and louder so it would capture my attention and make me forget about him. I'd still see he was there, but he'd stay in my periphery. I refused to look at him. I remember watching the show, his presence momentarily forgotten, when suddenly he was right next to me. Like he instantaneously leapt forward. He was right next to me. I could feel him staring at me. He screamed, the loudest thing I've ever heard, deafening and mind consuming. I jumped and reflexively looked over, but it was just my jacket draped on the armrest of the couch vaguely resembling the shape of a person. Heart pounding, I tried to return to the TV, but I could still see him there, standing in the corner, watching me. Well, this is absolutely terrifying. Tiny man in an apartment. Do you believe it, or is it all in his mind? Number three, creepy pharmacy. This one comes at us from Kygnus875. This happened maybe 10 years ago when I was in my early 30s. I was standing in line at the local pharmacy to get my prescriptions. This is a small town, and I'm a regular there, so they know me on site. I was behind a couple of other people in line, and there were a couple of people behind me. I kept feeling a tickle in my hair in the back of my head, but every time I'd look, the guy there was a few steps back and he was looking at the floor. This happened several times, and by the time I was at the front of the line, the pharmacist told me that she wanted to talk about my medication in the consultation room that they had at the time. I thought this was weird because we both knew I'd been on this medication for years and would be for life. It's nothing new. She told me that the man behind me had been stepping forward, sticking his nose in my hair and smelling before quickly stepping back and looking at the floor. This shook me pretty badly as this is such weird behavior, especially in my little town. If this dude does this anywhere, he's f not just a little town. The pharmacy staff insisted on having me wait there until the guy was distracted. And they had a security walk me to my car and watch me drive off to make sure I was gone before hair sniffer McGee came out and saw what I was doing and what direction I was driving. I still use this pharmacy and some of the people still work there. I will always be grateful that they took the initiative to make sure I was safe that day. Yeah, kudos to them for looking out. I don't even know what I would have done in that situation, honestly. Like, it's one thing to have this happen and then have to deal with it in the moment, but to not realize that it's happening and to 
find out later, I would be sick to my stomach. Hell no. Number two, Hotel from Hell. This one comes at us from Tbug411. This past Monday, my coworkers and I returned to our hotel from a day of work out in the field. Rebecca and I walked to our rooms, and as we stood outside of our rooms, I opened mine, and I saw somebody in the bathroom. So I said, hello? Nobody answered. And my first instinct was that maybe it was a cleaning lady in there. And then I saw my bag with my clothes in her hand. So I said to my coworker, there's a woman in my room. And then I asked the woman, what are you doing with my stuff? And it gets a little fuzzy here because I can't remember everything I said and what she said, but she kept mumbling about how her key still worked. I was in shock and she was obviously very flustered having been caught mid robbery. So she dropped my bags and fumbled around with her purse and a white plastic bag. By this time, my coworker was behind me watching all the insanity unfold. This woman was scrambling and walking towards the door and I said, what's in the bag? Thinking that it's probably my stuff. And she said, uh, no, 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 it's just my things. It's just my things. I'll show you. And so she did. And I looked in and I didn't see anything of mine. So since I'm obviously in shock at this time, I let her leave. I went into my room and it's been ransacked. I did a quick look around to see if anything had been taken. All of my electronics were still there. And then I went into the bathroom and I saw my underwear, my bikini and my clothes just shoved into my own bags randomly. And then I looked on the counter and I saw that she got into my medication. I'm not sure what was going through my head at the moment other than I wanted it back so I ran out the door to go find her. I ran to the laundry room downstairs and out to the side of the hotel and I didn't see her. I realized I was never gonna find her so my co-worker and I went down to the lobby to tell them what had happened and then we all called the police. When we went back up to my room to wait I noticed that there is this metal bat on my bed a little larger than one of those novelty wooden bats that you get at a baseball game but there's also a flashlight on the end. She also left behind a necklace that must have fallen out of her bag when she was scrambling with mine. I was mostly freaking out at this point because I thought that she'd gotten away with my medication that I need. Of course, that's a very natural thing to think of. Also a very adult thing to think of after you got robbed. The police got there and took our statements and looked around the room as well. One thing that I noticed was that there were like little bits of drywall in the sink and I pointed that out to the cops, but none of us really knew where it came from. We started looking at the door and the windows to see if she pried her way in maybe somehow, but there's nothing. So we kind of just went with the idea that she had a spare key or something like that. Even though the hotel front desk was adamant that there's no way that could be the case. The officer that came back brought two more officers as backup because they thought the woman might still be in the vicinity. But after our statements were taken, there was really nothing else they could do, so they left. I sat down to finally make some calls to tell people, and as I'm on the phone thinking about the drive while in the sink and it still didn't make sense to me and then it hit me. I got my coworker and asked her to help me pull up this mirror on the wall and we took the mirror down and there's a hole there just big enough for somebody to squeeze through. So I asked Brian and Rebecca if I should call the cops again to let them know that I had found this and my boss said there's still two cop cars in the parking lot. So I went down to tell them and the female cop kind of rolled her eyes but the young guy said all right I'll come check it out. They both come back up look in the hole and found a pillow Blankets, cigarettes, clothes, toothbrushes. This woman had been living in the wall behind my mirror for God knows how long. She had access to me in my room at all times. One of the officers called the original officer to come back and take photos. She explained to him what was going on and all you hear over the radio is that cop say, no f away. Obviously we packed up and left immediately, but what's even crazier is that she has probably been there a long time. The last time we stayed at this hotel, I would randomly smell cigarette smoke and I assumed somebody was smoking in their bathroom and I was traveling through the vents. But no, it was just somebody smoking on the other side of a mirror. She had access to other rooms too. The holes in the wall were from a renovation and the hotel hadn't properly patched them up. So they just cover them up with mirrors. What is a Shawshank Redemption? Just put a poster of someone? She could have been hanging out in people's rooms when they were gone. So that's what it looked like. That's the scariest story. Like imagine just sitting on the toilet and then the mirror starts to move with like fingers behind it. Let's just say it would be a pretty good thing I was already sitting on the toilet when that happened. And finally, number one, come here, baby. This one comes from Arnold Schrodinger. A few years ago, I was living alone in a little house which had a heavy back door that would swell up a bit after it rained. And it gets really tough to open and it makes a lot of noise. Happens with my door as well. Makes no sense. It's almost like your door gets fat. It's like, what are you doing? Late one night, I had passed out on my sofa in the living room on the opposite side of the house, but woke up to something which I now assume was the back door being opened. I'm an idiot, by the way, and I used to never lock the back door. Netflix was still blaring away on the laptop as I slowly squinted my eyes open and realized there was this black outline of someone standing still in the hallway looking down at me. And being completely disoriented in my waking state, my mind latched on to the first thought that came to my mind, which was that maybe it was my girlfriend. I was naked at the time and I pulled my blanket back with my legs spread out and my junk hanging out 
out and I called to her in my best deep sexy voice, come here baby. Upon discovering on a naked 6 foot 200 pound man beckoning to them with his genitalia, the not my girlfriend person immediately turned around, revealing a large backpack and booked it for the back door. And by the time I stumbled up to the door, all I could hear was them taking off into the darkness at full sprint. I could only guess, based on their height, that they did not come here with the bold intention of being the little spoon. Honestly, I'm glad this happened the way it did. I mean, the burglar came in, saw your sleepy, naked, junk out body and then left empty handed. Good, go wash your eyes out and stop robbing people while you're at it. Guys, always lock your doors. The countless stories that I've heard about my friends getting robbed at school, always put a little piece of wood in your sliding glass doors. My buddy one summer just kept his screen door locked at the back of the house because he wanted the breeze. Give me nail clippers and one minute, I'll get through a screen. You know what's worse than sweating? Sweating and crying because you got robbed and you're still hot. Enjoy the breeze. In at five, r slash paranormal. I mean, it's right there in the title, paranormal. And honestly, what's more scarier than that? This subreddit contains some people's most terrifying and unexplainable encounters with the paranormal, ranging from deceased relatives to demons. A notable post from the subreddit reads as follows. I quote, I live on the coast of South Carolina and my backyard is directly on the marsh. I woke up and went downstairs to use the bathroom. Kept having this weird nagging feeling like I was forgetting something or something was off. So I went to find my mother. She She's a night owl and stays up super late doing gardening stuff and she likes to feed the raccoons. I went to the backyard and saw her about 100 yards from the back door facing the marsh. I called out to her but she didn't hear me so I started to walk out to her. Once I started getting closer she turned to face me with a completely blank expression. So I asked her what was wrong. I was about 12 feet away from her and she turned back towards the marsh. Then the f***ing back door opened and I turned to see my mum standing on the deck and she called out to me asking what I'm doing. I've never run so fast in my life. But I looked back to the marsh and could see that thing disappearing. It looked just like my mum. I yelled at my mum to go inside and that there was something out there. I told her what I saw and I've been crying and shaking. We woke up my husband and my dad and they think I must have still been asleep. I can't stop shaking. What the f just happened? Am I crazy? Did something try to lure me out to the marsh? I must be losing my damn mind. But I know what I saw. Wow, creepy stuff. To me it sounds like she might have just been sleepwalking and awoke after her mum yelled after her. But what do you think? Is there a shape-shifting entity lurking the marshes in South Carolina hunting for its next victim? In at 4, r slash glitch in the matrix. Glitch in the matrix is most people's preferred term to use when they get deja vu. It essentially means that something has sparked a memory in your mind, making you feel like you've already experienced whatever it is you are experiencing. That something you're doing feels like it has already happened to you. It's simple. Now some people over on r slash glitch in the matrix have documented some of their most frightening cases of deja vu. One of the scariest ones that I read goes as follows. I quote, this has been playing on my mind for years now. I had a very realistic dream about a friend of mine when we were both 19. In that dream, he died. We were sitting against a brick wall talking and he was telling me that sometimes our time is up and to make the most of it and some other advice. I woke up the next morning and was freaked out so I called him and told him about it. He laughed and said, that would suck, but it reassured me that he was fine and not going anywhere. Two days later, I had a call from his parents to say he had suddenly died in his sleep. The last time I spoke to him was when I called him after my dream. End quote. Creepy stuff. Now, this one feels more like a premonition to me or just a really spooky coincidence rather than a glitch in the matrix, but still, it's terrifying to say the least. Coming in at three, the murder trial. Uploaded to Reddit by Bottlewash to r slash ask Reddit, they responded to the question, what's the scariest story you know that is 100 100% true. They said, I quote, this is an incident that happened to me about 10 years ago. I live in Melbourne, Australia. I was driving home from work one night around 9pm midweek so the roads were quiet. As I was driving downhill I heard a sound that was like a jet engine roaring behind me. The next thing I knew a car goes flying past me going twice the speed limit. It looked like a fairly old crappy car. Car started to get the speed wobbles and then one of the tyres came flying off and rolled at speeds downhill whilst the car spun out and crashed. I stopped my car to make sure whoever was in side was okay. A guy got out of the car and looked over at me then started moving extremely quickly towards me. I don't know why but I hit my eternal locks on the car which was fortunate because no more than two seconds later the guy started grabbing at the driver's side door and smashing on my windscreen with his fists trying to get in. I'll never forget the crazy look he had in his eyes. I put my foot down on the accelerator and drove off back home. Now you may think the story is scary enough as is, well it gets worse. Let's continue. They go on to say, I decided to swap cars once I got home and drove 
drove back to see what was going on. I saw two fire trucks and about four police close to where the incident happened. When I got back to the crash site, the guy was no longer there, so I decided to head home. The next day at work, I was online bored reading the news when I found an article that shocked me. The article was about a guy who had been in a police chase for one hour and the police stopped chasing him because it was becoming too dangerous. Turns out the guy was high on meth, had stolen a car an hour drive away, and had been in a hot pursuit since. After crashing the car, the guy apparently crossed to the other side of the road and hailed the first car that appeared, which was a taxi. He got into the taxi and stole it. In the process, he pushed the driver out of the driver's side door and the driver got stuck and dragged at speeds. The driver died from the incident. I called the police and had a detective assigned to me. He fingerprint checked my car and got a statement. I had to testify in the Supreme Court as a key witness in a murder trial. The guy got 30 years and they told me that my testimony was one of the main factors in convicting him. Whoa, how terrifying is that? Remember, always lock your doors. You never know who you might come across down a quiet road. Coming in at 2, Grandma's Light is always on. Uploaded to r slash no sleep by Saint Etropy, they said, I quote, In one corner of my grandma's living room stood a lamp that was always never turned off. She would change the bulb every week like clockwork, waiting until the afternoon sunlight poured through the windows and filled the room. Even then she hurried, holding her breath until the deed was done and the lamp was back on. I would ask her about it once in a while, each time she would smile softly, tussle my hair and probably change the subject. I didn't learn the truth until I was 13, the first time I turned off the lamp. I just wanted to see what would happen. Grandma screamed when she walked into the darkened living room. A plate of cookies falling from her hands and crashing to the floor. I could hear her praying under her breath as she raced to turn the light back on. Tears were shining in her eyes when she turned to me, her lips pressed thin. Without warning, she slapped me hard across the face. She gathered me up in her arms and begged for forgiveness. She then finally told me about the lamp. It was a ghost light, she said. Ever since she and my grandpa had bought the house back when they first arrived in America, the spirits of the dead had plagued her. She ended up asking grandpa for help. It was he who had first lit the ghost light, and as long as that beacon burned through the darkness, she had never seen another spirit. Something woke me later that night. I lay in bed listening to the darkness until I heard scratching coming from the living room. Rats were the last thing I wanted to deal with at the moment I rolled over with a groan, determined to ignore it until the morning. The scratching continued, constantly jerking me from the edge of sleep. I threw the blankets off and stormed out into the hall. I didn't bother turning on the lights as I made my way to the living room. I knew every inch of the house and I moved confidently through it. I was furious at having been woken and my anger was ill prepared for what I found. An elderly woman was crouched in the corner, her gaunt back to me. She was scratching at the floor where the walls met, stopping every few minutes to cock her head. I had no idea how this woman had gotten into my house and though it was obvious she needed help, my hand shook as I reached out to gently squeeze her shoulder. I meant to ask where she lived, who her caretaker was, but the words were driven from my mind when she turned and I saw her face. Her eyes were solid black, bottomless pits that didn't reflect the moonlight. Her jaw hung impossibly open, unhinged, and the dark tunnel of her mouth spiraled down into her throat. I had a moment to realize who she was, to recognize the familiar map of wrinkles in her face, the curls of her wispy hair. Then my grandma screamed. I shrieked, stumbling backwards away from the nightmare in the corner. My arms flailed in the air, reaching for the nearest lamp and my hands touched the ghost light. I yanked the chain, filling the room with light and she was gone. I never turned off the ghost light after that. After letting the bulb burn out one evening, I began changing it every week just as grandma had. Eventually I got married and luckily for me, my wife was tolerant of my strange fixation on the lamp. The light continued to burn and I lived my life happily enough. Ooh, this one truly shook me. There's something about the supernatural that I just don't want to mess with. Keep those lamps turned on, folks. And finally, in at number one, kidnapping. Posted to r slash no sleep by Nix2307, they describe how seven years ago when they were 12, 13, something awful happened to them. I quote, I was walking home from school. It was mid-June. I just parted ways with my friend and I had 15 minutes to walk by myself before I got home. I noticed while I was walking with my friend that I kept seeing the same red van along our journey. Now, we usually go a longer way so we can walk with all our friends, but this red van just kept popping up. Now I didn't think much of it, I just thought they were different vans, but after a few times I decided to memorize the number plate. After my mum had told me to do so if I ever felt like I was in danger, or if something just didn't feel right. I parted ways with my friend and started on my journey home. I decided to take a route that's a little longer than the one I usually take just because I didn't feel comfortable walking through the park by myself, and I just had a bad feeling through the whole walk home like something bad was going to happen. It was only a few streets away from my home when the red van started to just crawl behind me. This man looked in 
his late 30s, early 40s, popped his head out and started to try and get my attention and start catcalling me. I remember looking at him and just telling him that I'm not interested and to leave me alone, but that just angered him. He started screaming at me, telling me to get in the van. I'll forever remember his teeth, those disgusting yellow rotting teeth. They were like something from an anti-smoking advert to scare people into quitting. I told him that I would call the police if he didn't leave me alone. He proceeded to laugh in my face. He sped off a little forwards and parked the van, and he was waiting for me to walk past. I crossed the road and started running, trying to lose the man. Just when I thought I lost him, there he was, pulling up next to me. The sliding doors on the side of the car opened, and there was another man there, trying to grab me and pull me in. I screamed like there was no tomorrow. The man managed to grab my shoulder, and I just bit him until I could taste blood. The man let go of me, and I ran for my life. I jumped in the bush and hid. I waited until I didn't see the van for at least 30 minutes before I ran home. As soon as I got in, my parents started questioning me. I broke down crying and told them everything. They called the police and I gave them my statement, but nothing ever came of it. I refused to walk home until I turned 16. This is absolutely terrifying. There is nothing more horrible than a child getting abducted. Thank God she reacted the way she did. Stay safe out there, kids.